Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you, and I'm honored to bring the word today. It really is an honor and a privilege any time that we get to speak the word of the Lord, the, the active, alive word of God. And so it's just such a privilege, and I'm, I'm so glad to, to have this opportunity. So thank you, Pastor Jim, for this. Um, yeah, an update on Tom. So my husband Tom uh, works for the Ohio Ministry Network, which resources ministers and church planters. And right now is in Sri Lanka, which if you're like me, you had to look at a map to figure out exactly where that is. But it's an island south of India. Um, they're nine and a half hours ahead, which also is strange to me, like how the earth and the time zones work. But I wanted to share a couple of pictures. He's having a fabulous time of ministry. I haven't had a chance to talk to him much. I miss him like like crazy, um, but he is just having a really outstanding time. Uh, this is one of the churches that they've been serving in. Um, you'll see that there's people from all different backgrounds, a very diverse group of um of backgrounds in terms of religion. Um, so it is a uh, Buddhist government, a Buddhist country for the most part, but there's Hindu people, there are um, some Jewish folks, and some um, very small, very, very small Christian population. So um, volleyball is a passion of the people. So this is a picture of Tom and a volleyball team. Apparently, um, a funny story, they were... Uh, they set up a net in one of the villages to play volleyball, and they said, the American team is coming. The Americans are coming to play us in volleyball. Kind of framing it sort of like a mini Olympics type thing, I think. Let's just say they were not impressed with the American skills. Um, I think the preaching skills maybe were a bit, a, a bit more honed than the volleyball. They said every play was like bump, set, spike, you know, two spikers in the back. And so they're passionate about volleyball. Um, but they're also curious about the things of God. And so this is Tom this morning preaching uh, barefoot, which is how they preach in the villages. Um, and I think that's probably his dream come true. You know, the days of the suit and tie, gone, bring on the bare feet. So he looks like he's, you know, come from the beach preaching there. But he said they had an extensive time of prayer afterwards, individuals coming forward. He's working with the translator. And people coming forward from the Hindu faith, from the Buddhist faith, say, having a curiosity about this Jesus. And so it's incredible. The missionaries there, Kyle and Rebecca, have laid an incredible groundwork and um, are just doing, doing fabulous things, equipping the local people to do the ministry. So uh, Tom should be back in the next couple of days and be glad to have him, and I'm sure he'd love to share more. So we are in a series called Serve, and your pastors, Pastors Jim and Kelly, they, this is a mission, a lifestyle that they embody. And I think those of us who know them and who are getting to know them, we see this in their life and in their ministry. And it really is uh, true of them. Kelly is in the, in the back with our children today, loving on them. And, and, um, and I would say Christian and Amanda on her staff too, that is how they're wired and who they are and what an incredible leadership to, to bring that to us and have that type of foundation with us. Um, you know, when I think about this SERVE acronym, I understand that it, it was a model, is a model that several businesses use, including Chick-fil-A, right? Do we have any Chick-fil-A fans out there? Yes, you know, Chick-fil-A, they just know how to make you feel special, right? I mean, they've got the best system, two card lines merging into one. It's seamless. It's easy. I actually went to Chick-fil-A last night just I would say to prepare for this message and really, you know, live it. And I ordered a grilled chicken sandwich and a light lemonade. And you know what? In my bag, I got free fries. I was like, look at you, Chick-fil-A. And then you say thank you. And they say, you know it. Yep. The ice cream machine is never down at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> so they really, you know, they know how to do this thing right. And when we get to this, we use the SERVE acronym, which we've been learning about for the past several weeks. We are looking at V today. We're looking at V in the acronym. V is for value. So let's pray this morning as we go into today's message. Lord, give us ears to hear what the truth of your word is saying. 
and what the power of your spirit would reveal to us. Help us not only be hearers of your word, but doers. In Jesus' name, amen. So Pastor Petro spoke on this, this uh, topic a few weeks ago, and I love something he shared. And he said this, there are two ways to walk into a room. There are two ways to walk into a room. Here I am, <laughs> or there you are. There you are. And I think this is just so incredible to think about how the Son of God, how Jesus entered the world, and it was with the posture of there you are. And we see this in, um, in John chapter 1. Uh, I'll start with verse 9, and then I'd like to point out, kind of highlight this, me this message version. But John 1, 9 says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of truth and grace. This message version, verse 14 says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. He became one of us. He was uh, in the likeness of a man, fully God, but fully so ordinary. And if you know anything about the scriptures, you know this was not what the people expected, right? Not even close, even though there were over 300 prophecies of this is really who Jesus would be. They were convinced that someone with power and authority and kingship and someone whose scripture says the government would rest on his shoulders, this was someone who would show up with a sword, right? To slay their enemies and to take down every opponent. But we know that that wasn't necessarily the case. And maybe instead of a crown, he showed up with something like a hairnet. <laughs> something ordinary, something that a servant would wear. Actually, he showed up as a baby, as a helpless creature. And the people must have been so confused. They were so confused. And maybe instead of a sword, this is a better analogy of what he showed up with. <laughs> it's clean, it's from the dollar store, promise. <laughs> it's almost offensive, isn't it? To say this is, this is our King Jesus, he showed up with something like this. <laughs> but that's, that's exactly what he did. He showed up kind of with this opposite kingdom. And he ruled in a different way than, it, than was slashing enemies and the authority that a king of the day would have had. But the people knew this scripture in Isaiah 9. They said they knew this scripture, Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So they had high expectations, right? This was, this was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But actually, he came as Isaiah 53. He grew up from them, a tender shoot like a root out of dry ground. He had no majesty 
or beauty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. How many times in our lives are we sort of disillusioned by how we think God should have, could have, would have shown up? We have such a definition, and oftentimes it's based on what we know of him. It can be based on truth. It can be based on his word. But we have such a narrow definition that we're so focused on what he should have done that we miss what he is actually doing and he's about to do. I'm going to say that again. There are times when we are so stuck on what God should have done, how he should have done it, that we miss what he's doing and what he's about to do. And we know through the prophecy of Scripture and who Jesus actually was that it's what he's doing and what he's going to do is always better, right? It's always more. It's more complete. Actually, it was better that he sent his son as a human so he would know us, he would be with us, he'd be Emmanuel, the God who experienced the human condition. That was so much more than what a king could have done. It wasn't less. And God sent his son into the world not because he despised his son. I think sometimes we read John 3.16 and we said, for God to love the world that he sent his only son. And people can get a little hung up on that. Like, what kind of father would do that? But he sent his son not because he despised him or he didn't value his son, but because he loved you so much. And he knew that was not the end of the story. In John chapter, chapter 15, 13, this is the amplified version. I love this verse. The Bible says, no one has greater love or a stronger commitment than to lay down his life for his friends. No one has that kind of love than, that he would do this. And that is the God that we serve. With this kind of high esteem, this value on people, that he became nothing. He became that of a servant, the Bible says, in order to show you how much he valued you. I think there are a couple of things that we can really learn from, uh, from the text and really from Jesus' example of how we're to serve. And the first is this, that we should serve without expecting personal gain, accolade, or acknowledgement. We should serve without expecting personal gain, accolades, or acknowledgement. That is way easier said than done, right? We are in a sort of a dog-eat-dog -dog culture. You kind of, you got to look out for yourself, me, myself, and I, and that's how you get things done. But again, Jesus showed us, not with the example of cutting down your enemies, but an example of serving, that we should not only look to um, decrease ourselves, but to advance others without acknowledgement. And this is so hard. This is so hard in, in parenting and grandparenting and neighboring and being in the workplace where no one will ever know the sacrifices that you've made. And being a daughter and being a friend and being a husband, and being a son, being a brother. No one will ever know. And and Jesus encourages us by his example to say that's okay because I see it and I did it. And this is not, this is not over. So be strong. Keep fighting the good fight and serving well. In Mark chapter 10, the Bible talks of Jesus and it says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Second takeaway that I'd really like to, to consider is, is this. Let's serve others even when they don't recognize the value of what you're doing for them. Serve others even when they don't yet 
recognize the value of what you're doing for them. This requires that patience, some long suffering. And this is something that Jesus was so well acquainted with. Actually, it was his sort of wheelhouse and his specialty because even from the cross in Luke 23, when just 24 hours earlier they were hailing him as king, they were saying, oh yeah, actually this is who you are. We like it. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the king. Those same people were then hurling insults and say, there you are, now you're on the cross. And they were mocking him and tearing him down. And his response to serve them was this, Father, forgive them. They don't know yet what they're doing. So serving them, even when they had no idea, we have no idea what he's done for us. He's still, he's pouring out his love, pouring out his grace, pouring out this esteem and this value for humankind. And the truth is, he, he didn't really wear this type of crown, a golden crown or a hairnet. He, he actually wore a crown of thorns, right? He wore a crown of thorns that was placed on his head to mock him that said, really, you're the king of the Jews? How's that working for you? But he knew that he would have to wear the crown of thorns so that you and I could wear the crown of life. And that was the crown that gave us, gives us value as children of God. That he would call us a friend. That we'd be able to have the opportunity to spend eternity with him. Where the Bible says that every tear will be wiped from our eyes. That we have eternal peace. And that position wasn't one of lowly status. It wasn't one without authority or too passive. That position had the most authority to forgive our sin, to look at us, to look at us despite what we had done. And the Bible says in Psalm 18 that he stooped down to make me great, to make you great. He stooped down from his throne on heaven And it's through that that we understand that passage in Isaiah that he was talking about a whole different kind of government. He wasn't just talking about the broken system that man had made and how we rule and how we make political decisions. He was talking about a broken system of sin. And he said, I am the one who has power and authority to heal this and to fix this and to rule with a different kind of kingdom. And that's powerful. He left the throne of heaven to be with us, to be for us, and to lay down his life for us. And there are just a couple things that I'd like for us to consider today as we go to the Lord in communion. One, the first question that I'd like you to consider is how can I serve someone else with this type of mentality, with this type of position and posture that Jesus had? How can I serve someone in this sort of way? And the second question is this. Maybe you're feeling exhausted from serving. Maybe you're feeling unnoticed and unappreciated. Maybe you just need some encouragement from the Lord himself today to keep going and to keep serving with the heart to value others even when they don't see the value of what you're doing. Let's stand as we go to the Lord in prayer today. Lord, we just bless you. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we've um, been in your word. And we've been able to hear from you and learn from you about what it means to have a heart of serving others. And there's no one who knows it better than you, Lord, of how to serve well and how to give everything, not from a place of being a doormat, 
or being passive, but a, a place of having humble authority. And God, I just pray for us today. Lord, I pray you'd reveal to us, Lord, areas where we can serve. We can become doers of the word. We can be an example to others through the way that we value them like you did, Lord. Reveal to us names and faces right now, our family members. God, reveal to us those who are difficult to serve and difficult to love. And by your Holy Spirit, just give us some creative thinking today about how we can do that. And Lord, I pray for those of us who are just frankly sort of burnt out from serving, from giving. And as our eyes are still closed, I just ask that if that's you this morning, would you raise your hand or lift your palms to the Lord? You're just exhausted from giving, from serving, from being that needed one. Lord, you see those in this place who are feeling weary, who are feeling the heavy burden of walking with others, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bring down a sense of encouragement and strength, Lord, that you would remind them that you have equipped them for every good thing in this season and that their reward, even though it is so unseen and unappreciated, maybe even devalued or misunderstood, God, that you see it today. You see it and you say, I will carry this burden. I'll make it light. I'll make it easy because it's in my strength. I'm thinking this morning of, of the verse in Zechariah chapter 4 that says, It's not by might nor by power. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not by your striving and your doing and your planning and your hurrying and your rushing. It's by the power of God's spirit in you. And that's the power that caused Jesus to rise from the grave. And that's the power that's within us. Not just to do big things, to do heroic things, but to do mundane, daily, hard, difficult things for others. And God, I just thank you that in that, Lord, as we empty ourselves and serve others, your word says that you stoop down that you bow down and you lift us up. God, we receive that strength today. Can you just say to yourselves, church, can you say, I receive that strength, Lord. I receive that strength. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I just thank you for your church. I thank you for these beautiful people. God, equip them. Probably the most powerful remembrance we have of Jesus' act of valuing us, of serving us, is through communion. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, as we take communion this morning, the ushers will dismiss you by rows and just reflect on, on the Lord's goodness Come to him with the posture of seeking whatever he has for you this morning.
we sing that together? Let's stand. Say, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. that you bless us as we go and keep us until we meet again in Jesus name we pray and we thank you God